The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. It's not fun or exciting, but it's one of the most critical services towns and cities provide, waste collection and diversion. I'm Nam Kiwanuka, and tonight on the Agenda in the Summer, as TVO partners this week with AMO, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, during their annual conference, we'll learn what cities are doing to address recycling and food waste. Millions of tons of food worth billions of dollars go straight into the garbage every year in this province. Municipalities manage that waste and they're looking to do better. With us now on how her city is creating Canada's first circular food economy from Guelph, Ontario, Barb Schwarzen Truber, Executive Director of the Smart Cities Office for the City of Guelph. Hi Barb, it's nice to meet you. Good morning, it's great to be here. Uh, do you mind giving us just a quick explanation of what a circular food economy is? Sure. So um, the best way to think about a circular food economy is to think about our current economy, which is quite linear in nature. So we take uh, materials from the earth. Uh, we use those resources to create copious amounts of good. And then inevitably, we end up throwing those goods away uh, and all of the waste along the way that uh, goes into producing those goods. So a circular economy is, a, is one that actually, in contrast to that, anticipates and designs for all of those resources to either safely be returned back into nature or to be put into other systems where they can be made into other things, reused, renewed, recycled. And how would you describe the state of the food system in Guelph? Well, um, the city of Guelph is a mid-sized city of about 120,000 people, and we're surrounded by the county of Wellington, which uh, has a rich uh, agricultural history and some of the best Class A farmland in Ontario. We're right in the heart of the Toronto to Waterloo Innovation Corridor, so uh, it's a place where technology innovation in clean tech and agri-food and advanced manufacturing takes place. Um, Another important part of our food system, I would say, is the University of Guelph, which is a treasure. It's Canada's food university, and the Errol Food Institute and world-renowned uh, food experts are located here. Mm -hmm. The community sector in Guelph, in fact, created uh, one of the first municipal food charters nearly 10 years ago now, and they're constantly innovating and uh, trying new ways to make sure that people have access to healthy food. So um, the food system is really uh, made up here of passionate farmers and entrepreneurs and urbanists and social innovators that are all really working hard to uh, create a vibrant uh, and inclusive food system. But in spite of all of that, uh, and in, in spite of the fact that we are a pretty affluent community, one in seven households are food insecure and the cost of healthy food just keeps rising. And it's gone up about 30% in just the last eight years alone. How much is that, um, you know, we, we, you're, you were talking about the innovation that's happening in Guelph. So how much of uh, food waste and food insecurity, how big a problem is it in Guelph? Uh, well, we can look to, uh, the, it's, it's no different than the problem on a global scale. So globally, a billion people are hungry or undernourished. And um, the paradox is in uh, that despite the abundance of food, nearly 40% of the food never makes it to the plate. And all of that food waste inevitably ends up in landfills where it creates methane gas that's about 25 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. So the food system itself is a driver of climate change and the waste from the food system certainly goes into contributing to that.
You know, at the beginning of uh, the pandemic, people were running to the grocery stores to stock up on uh, wipes, uh, to stock up on toilet paper. And then we live in a new reality of having to uh, line up to get into the grocery stores. Has COVID-19 exposed any flaws in the food system in Guelph, Ontario? Yeah, the pandemic, like like across Canada, has certainly exposed the vulnerabilities of the food system and um, the deficiencies. Uh, it's exposed the fact that uh, when the system gets um, into this kind of uh, disequilibrium, the supply and demand get out of balance. So I think what it's also done is it put a face on all of the people that are uh, part of the food system from the grocery store clerks, to the farmers, to the truck drivers that distribute the food, to the restaurant owners and so on. So it has really impacted our community. We expect um, and we know that it has placed even more people into uh, food insecurity. And I don't know about you, but it certainly meant that a lot more plastics than takeout containers have come into my house. So. It, it really has had an impact in a variety of ways. Food businesses are struggling to survive uh, and to adapt, although some of them have been able, like restaurants and, and the city of Guelph has created a dining district, outdoor dining district, which has helped, but everybody is struggling to pivot to, uh, to respond to the new reality. I think it was a, it's been a major wake-up call for all of us because we take certain things for granted. Um, and with Guelph, Ontario, thinking of the future, can you explain to us what our food future is? Sure. So uh, last year, we were really fortunate with our partners, the County of Wellington, to win the Smart City Challenge. Infrastructure Canada, the federal government, put out a challenge across Canada, 120 communities applied and uh, we were lucky to win, uh, successful in winning $10 million. So wait, can I just uh, interject for a second? So what was the goal of the Smart Cities Challenge? So the goal of the Smart Cities Challenge was for communities to identify a community or social problem to which they might apply social innovation as well as data and technology to try to solve it. Mm -hmm. So when we looked at that challenge and we looked at our community, we really felt that uh, we have, of course, had to focus on agri-food because that's such a part of our community. And the uh, fact that we are on the Toronto to Waterloo Innovation Quarter and have a, a deep um, skills and expertise in data and technology locally and at the university, we felt that agri-food was certainly the focus of our challenge. And then when we looked at the issues that people were facing around food insecurity, the environmental impact of food, uh, we decided that our vision would be to create Canada's first circular food economy. And what would that look like if you could walk us through the steps of what you're planning to do in Guelph, Ontario? Sure, so I can talk a little bit about what we've already started with in this last year. We wanted to move quickly and accelerate our work uh, to support the social and economic recovery. But our goals are to increase access to healthy, nutritious food for people, mm -hmm. to create new circular businesses and collaborations, and to not only prevent food waste, but to find new and creative ways of using waste to create more value. So in this last uh, few months, we really just got started in January. We've created a micro-grant program for businesses who are looking to pivot their business model or people that are looking to start new food businesses. We're providing tools uh, and consulting to food processors who, so that they can reduce and prevent food waste. Our partners, our food security partners, have uh, been delivering emergency food boxes to people. We're looking at trying to deliver over 100,000 of those by the fall. And we've been doing some creative things with restaurants, um, helping them um, online food delivery hubs from local producers and to deliver that food in a carbon neutral way through e-bikes. Mm -hmm. So you can call and have uh, local food delivered to your home on an e-bike. Um, we also uh, delivered 700 children's gardening kits <clears throat> to children to support their learning and gardening at home during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And in the fall, we're going to launch an urban agriculture challenge so that uh, we can have a whole variety of projects that 
help us understand the art of the possible in terms of growing food for community benefit within within urban areas. There's work that we're going to do to do a challenge in our waste system to uh, bring in artificial intelligence to better understand the kind of waste that happens at the curb and to potentially give feedback to households on how they could reduce that waste or use it differently. There's a whole range of work that the county is doing um, to help farmers to get access to broadband connectivity, which is really lacking in rural areas and to help them to learn and deploy and understand more digital agriculture technology. So that's just a range of things we've started with and, and you're gonna see those kinds of projects continue over the next four years as we figure out how to really reimagine our food system. So this will take four years, you said? Yeah, it's a four year project and we have over a hundred collaborators uh, from every sector in the community, from education to healthcare to the business sector and so on. So these are all leaders in our community and residents that are quite passionate about supporting this project and really reimagining what a, a sustainable, equitable, just food system could look like in the future. Well, I was going to say you can have a great idea, but if you don't have buy-in from the people, it's just an idea. So how has the response been like from the community? You know what? People are showing up every day with uh, tremendous ideas about how they can get involved and how they can contribute. In the next month, we're going to launch an online platform that will connect people wanting to do, you know, community gardening uh, all the way to technology and data experts that want to lend their expertise to this project. Do I? And, uh, uh, yep. No, no, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so. Um, we really have had a tremendous response and the project is being led by um, uh, agencies in our community like public health, like our social innovation center and so on. Do other jurisdictions have anything like this? Um, not, I, 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 we are, we will be the first circular <laughs> food community in Canada. There are certainly other jurisdictions that are working on circular economy. The Netherlands uh, is working on smart cities and circular economy. So there are places to look to, but um, putting it all together and focusing on food is uh, a little bit unique. And how will this project affect the average household <laughs> in Guelph? Well, we, we think about what will it look like to uh, a resident sitting on their front porch four years from now. And uh, what we hope is they'll have more healthy, affordable food options right within their own neighborhood that they'll see urban agriculture projects and how food is grown and they can get involved. They'll know a lot more about how to manage food waste and um, they'll have more, they'll know their local farmers and they'll be able to access fresh produce from them <clears throat> as well. They'll be able to make more uh, choices to consume products that are sustainable uh, within the food system. Barb, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's always so exciting to hear about innovation happening in Ontario uh, that's offering solutions. We appreciate your thank time. Thank you very much. We appreciate thank your you. time. Take care. The agenda is always on. To catch up on conversations from this week or any week, visit our website, tvo.org slash the agenda, or our YouTube page at youtube.com slash the agenda. It's all there for whenever you want to watch. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. Those are the three R's when talking about waste. The one that gets the most attention is recycle, as with Ontario's Blue Box program, but change is on the horizon to boost efforts to reduce waste. It's called producer responsibility, and to explain, we're joined by Norman Lee, Director of Waste Management of the Region of Peel. Hi, Norman. Hi, hi, Nam. So in Ontario, we have 444 different municipalities, yet we have about 200 blue box programs. Why is that? Well, not every municipality has a blue box program, and a number of smaller municipalities uh, combine and share a blue box program, so the, the number of programs is less than the number of municipalities. Do you think that creates more problems than it solves? I think uh, fewer maybe is a little bit better than more because every municipality, they, they're not all different and they're generally the same, but 
there's slight differences between different blue box programs. I hear all the time, you know, if somebody recycles in Toronto and they live in Toronto and they visit Peel mm -hmm. and the blue box program is slightly different, they find it confusing. Well, let's get into our conversation, but I want to show everybody at home um, where the residential, our residential waste goes. Only 17% goes into the blue box, 12% goes in the green bin, 10% uh, is yard waste, 10% is through other, and 50% of that, of what gets thrown out, ends up disposed in landfills. What's wrong with our blue box program? Well, the Brew Black program, and you can see it's it's the biggest program of all of those for, for diverting waste from landfills. So it's actually performing fairly well. The challenge with the Blue Box program is that it's it's uh, it's stopped improving the last few years. So the, the purpose of the Blue Box program, of course, is is to help us reduce our impact on the environment. We do that by conserving resources. When you recycle something, you get to, you know the manufacturers use that instead of getting new raw resources. It conserves energy. It reduces the need for landfill space. So after some three decades of growth of the blue box program it, it's kind of flattened out and for the last five to ten years there hasn't been a lot of growth in the blue box uh, so we need to we need to figure out how to get that uh, get that turned around and that's the the purpose of these new uh, pieces of uh, legislation that are coming out the regulations and what changes are being proposed well the the, the ministry uh, they looked at the province looked at a number of possibilities and they consulted broadly on it a few years ago and they landed on the key change being a switch to full producer responsibility. So the, the folks who produce packages will become fully responsible for managing them at the end of their life. Right now municipalities run the blue box program and producers chip in to help pay for it. The challenge with that is uh, there's a lot of packaging innovation right now and a lot of new packages come on stream every year mm -hmm. and the sorting systems that municipalities develop we just can't keep up with all that change uh, taxpayers just can't afford the money to to keep changing our sorting systems to keep up with it mm -hmm. so the thinking is if we switch to full producer responsibility where the producers are now responsible also for the sorting system uh, it will get better. When we say producers, uh, who do we mean? Uh, well, it's a whole range of people, but if 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 a company produces a package in Ontario, they're a producer. Any packages that are produced outside of Ontario, a company that imports them into Ontario is defined as a producer. And if they don't even have one of those, whoever retails or sells the package would be considered the producer. In fact, right now, Loblaws is the largest producer in Ontario because they, they retail a lot of uh, materials that are produced uh, by others. Um, I'm just guessing, you mentioned that producers already contribute to paying for uh, waste management. But in my head, I'm thinking, why would producers want to take the full responsibility of this? It just sounds like it's going to cost a lot of money for them. Well, producers see the same problem that we do. Uh, a lot of the larger companies have uh, adopted corporate so social responsibility programs where they want to reduce their environmental footprint. They want to see higher recycling. When they develop these new packages, they want to see them be able to go into the blue box and not into landfill. Uh, so if, if taking on full producer responsibility lets them achieve that, then they, then they support the move. For some of the, the larger producers that operate uh, inside and outside of Ontario, they, they would like to harmonize programs across Canada uh, so they don't have a different administration administrative process in Ontario than they do somewhere else. If the producers do want to take this on, and it, uh, I'm guessing they're going to be paying more money, is there a possibility that that is going to be transferred to the consumers? It's, a, it's always a possibility that they'll transfer it to the consumers. So producers will be taking on additional costs by doing this, uh, whether they, they choose to absorb it, whether they pass it on just in the cost of goods sold. Uh, ultimately, the, the consumer will end up paying something different for this. 
So the Although I, I will say that the cost shouldn't be that much. You know, when we when we look at the cost of the blue box program across the province, it's a big number. But when you spread that over the millions and millions of packages that go into the blue box, it, it can be less than a penny a package. It's it's not a big number on a on a per package item per per product item. That would make people kind of pause and think, well, if it's going to, uh, it's not going to be very expensive and if it can be done, why has it taken so long to um, have this as an, as an alternative? It's, it's taken a while because it's complex. Mm -hmm. You know, municipalities run the program, uh, the waste service providers are involved often providing contracted service to municipalities. Uh, so just unwinding all of that and, and sending it over to producers is not a not a simple task. It's not impossible, and it can be done if we all work together. We can do it very smoothly, uh, but it is a complex complex item, and not every producer. A, a lot of the producers are progressive and they want to protect the environment, but not every producer is of that mindset. So there's there's a few of them who who would prefer to to stay in the old model to keep business as usual. Yes. Mm -hmm. What will this mean? What would this mean for municipalities? Well, the obvious impact for municipalities is there'll be a, a savings for taxpayers. In in Peel Region, we have uh, 1.5 million residents, and we expect uh, to see savings and avoided costs in, in the order of 15 million dollars per year. So we'll be able to use that money to fund other priorities or, or to you know, lessen the tax impacts. Um, across the province, the number is close to 150 million when you add it all up. So that's the obvious uh, impact is the financial saving. What, what's maybe less obvious is some possible uh, program changes and service changes. So producers will be taking over uh, the operation of the blue box, they'll be responsible for it. They may hire municipalities to provide the service for them, or they may uh, choose to do it on their own. Uh, so we could see slight changes in how the blue box is collected, how often it's collected. And as the regulation is being written, uh, there's a lot of tension and pressure from different, uh, different sides on, on components of the regulation. For example, there are some who are advocating for fewer items to go in the blue box. There are some who are advocating for fewer uh, sources to be pick, picked up from fewer places, especially parks and public spaces. So in Peel Region right now, we collect the blue box material from parks and public spaces, and that's included in the cost of the service. Um, so if, if those are no longer in the service when producers take it over, that's things like arenas, libraries, uh, parks, other other public buildings might not have blue box uh, collection service. So, these are some of the the possible changes. Some, uh, a few, very few, are, are advocating for lower targets, mm -hmm. uh, so that less material has to be collected. Uh, the majority, certainly all municipalities, and uh, I think the majority of producers support higher collection targets to see improved environmental benefits. The one, uh, the one thing that makes me hopeful is uh, Minister Urich has said on more than one occasion Jeff Urich, now, yeah. uh, Jeff Urich, yes, mm -hmm. that um, he he wants the transition to be seamless. If if you have blue box collection before transition, he wants them to have collection after, and he also wants in, improved environmental outcomes. He wants Ontario to have some of the highest uh, diversion targets in North America. So I, I'm hopeful that the the regulation will uh, will fall into place, and residents will continue to see the the type of service they're seeing now. Maybe even with some improvements. It sounds like you, you are right. It's very complicated, and it sounds like there's a, a lot of moving pieces. Uh, if the municipalities do end up saving money, would those cost savings be transferred to households? Well, ultimately, they would be one way or another. Um, and each municipality, their, their council will have to make a decision on what to do with it. I mean, one, one possibility is to have a, a tax cut. Another possibility is to kind of offset some tax increases. Uh, there's a lot of pressure in Ontario to add 
new services and different services. We have a lot of priorities, even in Peel region, that are not fully funded right now. Where's the pressure so coming from? Um, there's, all, there's all sorts of pressures in, in, uh, within, within my waste management division, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of pressure to increase the diversion of organic waste. So kit kitchen waste, uh, food scraps, those sorts of things. I mean, and I'm thinking, too, that uh, people are wondering if this transition sounds as complicated as you say, will it end up costing, uh, will that cost fall on residents then? The cost of the transition itself is relatively small compared to the cost of the program itself. I think across, across the province, the program costs about $300 million a year to run. About 150 of that is spent by municipalities and 150 by producers, more or less. Um, the cost of transitioning won't be anywhere near that big. And, you know, we, we've said um, if, if we cooperate, we can make this transition very simple. We can make it seamless. We can make it smooth for residents. And we can make sure there's no, there's no stranded costs if, um, if it doesn't go that smoothly and if if municipalities are left with some stranded assets uh, because of the timing of transition that that sort of thing or if we have to cut contracts short mm -hmm. those costs obviously could could start to add up uh, peel region the, the transition phase is is between 2023 and 2025 peel region our preferred transition is in 2024 uh, which matches up with the end of our major collection contracts. If we transition early, we may have to uh, terminate those contracts or, or make major amendments to them, and that gets expensive. So there's, there's ways of doing it to keep the cost down, and that's mm -hmm. our goal, is to keep the cost of transition down. Norman, thank you so much for your time, and, and we appreciate your insights, and it's good for us to be thinking about these things. We appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure being here. And that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer. Tomorrow, we've got more coverage of municipal issues in partnership with AMO during their annual conference. We'll hear from three Ontario mayors about leading their communities in the COVID-19 era. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. See you again tomorrow. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Looking for more of TVO's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit tvo.org slash daily and sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, Steve Pakin's blogs, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org slash daily.